But the reason is that Apache Camel has been where I've been working for over six years, and of which five and a half as a full-time committer on the project. Back then, I was uh, hired by a company called FuseSource, and about two years ago, we were acquired by Red Hat. But Red Hat still loves Apache Camel, so I'm still a full-time Camel committer. I am also uh, wrote a book about it, OK? So, Back, so we have this awesome programming language called Groovy, and to steal a phrase from Guillaume's keynote this morning, he said that Groovy has been rocking the JVM since 2003. And about four years later, in 2007, we got camels to rock the JVM. And about a couple of years ago, we got something that's even hard to rock on the JVM as well. So all these three projects has something in common. And during my talk, I'm going to give a bit hints of that. And then at the end, we're going to have the ta-da. OK? So here's just a brief again of what is going to be covered in this talk. Um, how many knows Apache Camel? Oh, shit. <laughs> OK. Um, for those of guys that does not know Camel, then I'm going to introduce you to Apache Camel. And the guys that knows it, you can might tweet or something. Um, then we're going to take a little examples in Java and Groovy. So that's where Groovy comes in. And then I'm going to talk to you about how you can actually try Camel by yourself. And we call it riding Camel. Uh -huh. And then uh, give some uh, pointers how you can actually create new Camel products from scratch. And then there's this hot I.O. products I'm going to talk about. And we have Q&A at the end. OK, but let me try to answer the first question that people have about Apache Camel. Why is it called Camel? Well, Camel is short for a concise application message exchange language. Easy peasy, everybody knows what that is. Well, maybe that's bullshit. Maybe Camel is just easy to type and remember. Or maybe, you know, the creator of Camel, James Strachan, used to smoke cigarettes back then. So he was sitting at his desk, and you know, the cursor was blinking, and he had to come up with a name. So he reads out for his cigarettes, and sometimes the answer is in front of you. We also have a link for some other reasons for the camel name. OK, so what is Apache Camel? To learn about a new product, a good idea is to go to that product website and see what they say on the, on the side. On the camel website, we say that Apache Camel is an integration framework based on enterprise integration patterns. There are these two facts I would like to emphasize, integration framework and enterprise integration patterns. So why an integration framework? I kind of like to picture an integration framework sort of like a toolbox, which has ready-made tools to help you with your integration problems. So you can focus at a higher level about the business problem and allow the tool <coughs> or the framework to deal with the low-level details. OK? So what about enterprise integration patterns? Well, that's in fact the book with that same title that was uh, published 10 years ago. And the authors, Gregor Hobie and Bobby Wolf, were consultants back then that went from client to client and helping their clients with integration problems. And then they took notes how to so about these problems and how to solve them. And after a while, they had so many notes that they actually compiled that into a book. So yes, in this book, we have recipes how to solve common integration problems. And these recipes are known as enterprise integration patterns. So you can also say that um, the enterprise integration patterns book, just go back to that one, is sort of like the integration bible. It's a very famous book, and it's very highly recommended for people working in the integration space. So the book has sort of done the same. Uh, for integration that the Gang of Four book has done for object-oriented programming. OK, so in the book, we have 65 patterns. And here are some of those on the slide here. That's a, you can you know, process messages using a content-based router. You can fill the messages. You can route messages dynamic. You can send messages to a number of res uh, recipients. You can split messages and aggregate, and so forth, and so forth. So what I would like to do now is to talk about uh, these enterprise integration patterns and where Apache Camel fit in. And for that, I would like to use an example. 
So suppose that you work, uh, you are working in a company, of course you do, and you uh, stand at a whiteboard. And at the whiteboard, you talk to a coworker about an integration problem. And this uh, example is a trivial example. It's about an order system. So we have some new orders coming in, and then we need to route these orders depending on its type. So either it's a widget or gadget. Yes, this is a very simple example. But with the help of the Enterprise Integration Panel Spook, you can actually find a solution for that problem, which is called the content-based router. And in the book, we now have sort of like a, a common terminology. We have a common graphical notation, and so on, so on. So this also helps, you, know, you can say, architects and developers to use the same terms, both in uh, architectural designs, but also in you know, tooling and what's not. So we can sort of use the same term now. This is really awesome what that book did. So now we have drawn that solution using graphical notation. But what we would like to do as well to write down using uh, English words the solution. So what we can do is say from new order. Then we need to make a choice. So when is widget to widget, otherwise to get. Okay, and then we add some parentheses. Then we add some dots and a semicolon. Um, I guess you guys can start to see where camel fits in, but this is not groovy code, so let's make it more groovy. So you can maybe do it like this, using a groovy DSL, but unfortunately the camel DSL, groovy DSL, is yet not so awesome yet, so we have to add the parentheses and all that. But we did save that last semicolon. <laughs> One so that's awesome. So yeah, Groovy is better than Java. OK, so whether you have Java code or Groovy code, uh, well, Groovy can probably run in a script, but Java code need to be also oh, um, need to be in a, in a class. But let's get back to that because I forgot about something. So in this route, uh, we have blue stuff, the, the blue stuff, the four blue stuff. What is that? OK, so. New order, that's an endpoint where messages come in or the orders come in. And in this example, we are using a message broker called Apache ActiveMQ. So we can just define an endpoint called ActiveMQ until it's a queue, and this is the name of the queue. Now, to determine if that order is a, um, is a widget or not, we can use a predicate for that. And th in this example, the the order messages are XML-based. Yes, this is an old example, so back then everything was XML. So we can use a language called XPART to, to determine if that message is an order or not. Likewise, we can define widget and gadget. Those are endpoints where we're going to send the message to. So we just send it back to the same broker, but on different queues. OK, so we have all this Java code. Or if we remove the semicolons, we'll have you know, Groovy code. And for the Java code, we should have it in a method. So let's put it inside a method. And we can give this method a name. We call it configure. A method should be in a class. So we put it inside a class, and we call this class my route. And my route extends another class called route builder. So what is route builder? Route builder is a class from Camel that allows end users to define routes in the configure method. So what we have on the slide is actual code that can compile and run by Camel. You know, the solution for that architectural problem we had on the whiteboard. So my point is that you can stand at the whiteboard and design these solution, and then you can sort of map that to code in a human readable way and put it inside something that can compile and run with Camel. Now, these endpoints and predicates and expressions have it not, you can also inline those directly inside that route below. So People that are already using Camel, they may be a bit more familiar with this kind of style, where everything is sort of in line in the same DSL. So you can just see this just one code statement with a lot of meta calls and a semicolon at the end. Um, what I would also like to say is that with this code, using Apache Camel as an integration framework, you know that toolbox? 
that allowed to abstract away all the low-level details allowed us to focus on the higher level. So this is the only code we need to write us for that solution. We did not need to write any code how to connect to a message broker to listen for new messages coming in on a queue. We did not have to write any code how to execute an XML uh, expression as a, as a predicate or how to send messages to a message queue and so on and so on. All that is low-level details taken care of by Camel. And you can also say that this code is something that you can show to non-developers, maybe your boss, and that person will be able to have some sort of understanding what is going on because it's sort of like a high-level abstraction for that solution. Camel also allows you to define routes in you know, XML or different languages as well. So we can also have a solution for the same problem here just using XML. Um, another powerful feature of a camel is that these endpoints are easy to configure using a UI notation. So let's say that you should not, you should pick up files instead of messages from a message queue. All you need to do is change that endpoint so to a file colon. That is the file component in camel. And then after that, you, you sort of configure that component. And the file component, you tell it where to pick up the directory to pick up the files from. Now, each component allows can be customized. So you can tell the file component that after it has processed that message, those files should be deleted. But you can also tell it to leave the files as is, or move them, or rename them, and whatnot, and whatnot. Now, if you are asked to, instead of sending these messages to a message queue, you should upload them to an FTP server. What should you do? Well, that is not so hard to do in Camel because you just need to find a Camel component that can do FTP, and there's a FTP component. So you just, instead of ActiveMQ, you type FTP, colon, and then the name of the FTP server, and then you know, maybe a port number, and then a username and a password, and then a directory where to upload the files. And that's it. Okay, so Camel is just, there's no, new language or something like that. It's just Java code, for example, so you get all the power from your Java code editor. Uh, likewise, in XML, there's a schema behind it, so your you tooling can assist you there as well when you define these routes. And also for the Groovy DSL, uh, your, your code editor can help you as well. But we do have support for Groovy closures. Yay! So here in the predicate, we can use Groovy closure. So we are looking for the in meshes if it has a header named zip code. And if that value of that zip code header is a number. And for that, we can use the groovy regular expression matcher, equals equals curly, whatever it is. So we have a bit of groovy code here. That's pretty awesome. OK, so for the high level architectural diagram of Apache Camel. This is all you need to know. Excuse me, let me take some more. So the concept or the idea with Camel is that in this center we have Camel context. So Camel context is Camel. It is the runtime of Camel. So the idea is that you have this Camel context, then you can add routes to it. And these routes you can define using different DSLs. We've seen the Java, Groovy, XML, and whatnot. In these uh, the routes, you can use enterprise integration patterns and call business processes and whatnot and whatnot. And then here on the bottom, to speak to the outside world or to integrate with other technologies, you use Camel components. So that's it. And speaking of components, Camel has a lot of components. Uh, it's hard to keep track even today. Um, we have more than 150. I think a guy said that we about 160 some in the latest release. So we used to sort of have a table for presentation where we had the name of all the components. I kind of given up on doing that. So what we have here is 40 components and another page with an additional 40 components. So that's not even half of the, all the components there is in Camel. Okay. So in summary, what is Camel? So we remember from the website in Camel there were two words you had to remember, integration framework, that toolbox, and enterprise integration patterns, which was that book. 
So you can also kind of see Camel as a sort of like a software implementation of that book. You saw that in Camel you can define routes, you know, high-level architectural designs can be defined as a route, and you use a DSL for that, Java, Groovy, whatnot. Um, in fact, there's also a fourth DSL, you know, from the language that we don't speak of, uh, the language with the slow compiler. Um, and we also learned that you can configure Camel endpoints as URIs, so it's easy to switch to file components, FTP components, and so forth and so forth. And it's just Java, XML, Groovy code, whatnot. So there's no magic there. And we also say Camel has no container dependency. You know, back then when Camel was rather new, you know, there used to be sort of like you had to run in a Java Enterprise application server or web application container or whatnot. There's no dependency in Camel, it's just a bunch of Java files, so you can just use it as sort of like a library or whatnot. So, you know, ideally you can run Kenny Camel on a JVM anywhere you want. And it has a lot of components. <coughs> Okay, so let's top that with a little example. So this is maybe the hello world of integration example. Um, integration is not sort of like a sexy web user interface and whatnot, so it's more, usually a good example is to copy a file from one directory to another. You know, then you, when you play with it, you can sort of copy a file to a directory and whoops, it's over there. Yeah. So this is also the first example in the Camel in Action book. So, this is how you can implement that using Camel code in Java. So we just have a regular Java class with a public static void main. So the first thing you need to do is create a Camel context, you know, that runtime Camel. So that's a construct of that new default Camel context. Then you add routes to it. So here we have a route builder and an inline route builder. In the configure method, we had that DSL. So it's just from file inbox to file outbox. And then we need to start Camel. Um, the start method is a non-blocking method, so we need some way of keeping that JVM running until we don't want it. But as this is just a trivial example, it just runs for 10 seconds and then it shuts down nicely. Um, so in Groovy example. So in Groovy, you do the same. You extend the route builder class from Camel. You have the configure method where you can define a, a route. So this time we're actually using a HTTP server using Jetty. Uh, so you can call that HTTP server, then the camel route kicks in, and then we're gonna send back a message. And we use a groovy closure again with the curlies, saying you call me, and then we call a groovy function, number. So it says you call me one times, two times, three times, four times, and we can see the function up there is just to increase the number. A simple example. And we could put that in a Groove script file. So I done that. So this is all the code in the Groove script file. So I have some imports in the top. And then there's this add grab annotation, which is pretty awesome that Groovy has that. So you can just have the Maven coordinates for what you need, your dependencies. So we have Camel Core, Camel Groovy, Camel Jetty, and then the logger. And then here at the bottom, you can see we do the same as the Java example, create a Camel context, add routes to it, start it and keep it running for a while and stop it. So it's the same. And if you run it from a shell, Groovy, and then the name of the script, it boots up and it logs out what it does, and you can call it from a web browser or something. I did it here, you called me three times. A trivial one. So talking about writing Camel, so how can you try Camel on your own when you get back home? So, what you can do is to go to the Apache Camel website, and there's a box, this is sort of like, yeah. Uh, and there's a download it today button. So you can click on that one and you can download the distribution of Camel. It's a zip file or a tarball and unzip it. Now, most people that are already using Camel do not do that to get a new release because they just use you know, Maven or Ivy or Gradle or whatnot to get the new dependencies. <coughs> but first time users, this might be a good idea because this distrib distribution contains some examples out of the box you can try. And you can run these uh, examples using Maven uh, from the shell, command line shell, or from 
editors such as Eclipse or Idea and whatnot, they have Maven integration out of the box. Uh, we used to have AND script files as well in the beginning, but it was sort of a pain to maintain both AND and Maven, so we dropped the AND ones. But now we're seeing you know, increased interest in Gradle as well, so might be able to you know, have Gradle files for the examples and maybe, maybe not. So you know, we always look for help if people want, would like to help with that. So a good first example to try is, is also something called the console example because it sort of reads from system in, so you can type something and then it writes it back again, and this time it just uppercase it. So if you're using the graphical notation from the book, it's an endpoint, it's a message transformation, and then it sends to another endpoint. And the, it, this example is implemented using a Spring XML file, so we have a camera context, then we can have routes inside that one, and from, and then the message transformation, and then to. So now pay attention to the message transformation, it's, it's using something called symbol. Symbol is an expression language that is built in by Camel. It comes out of the box in Camel. It, has, um, it allows you to do symbol expression, and that's why it was named that uh, in the early on. It was used to be much simpler than it is today. For example, you couldn't call a, a method on, a, on, on the message body as we can do today. Back then, there was much more symbol, so hence it was called symbol, but if you are naming it today, it should probably be called camel expression language. But if you are coming back home and you're a Groovy guy, then of course you can just uh, change that symbol to Groovy, and you can execute some Groovy script there or whatnot. The only thing you need to remember is to add camel Groovy component to your class path, and then Groovy itself. Uh, another example that is bit fun to try out. This is one, one of these Twitter examples, so it does a Twitter search for some keywords, and then it sends to a WebSocket, and then you can see from a web browser these coming in real time. Um, so we've been at slide number 55, so let's try to leave the slides for a bit and try that. Um, I'll see if the Wi-Fi should still be working. So Maven X, so I should have a so let me just run this example. I think it's maybe an extra Java. Um, each example has a readme file that tells you how to st start them. There are usually two different ways, Maven extra Java or Maven camel run. Camel run is a plugin from camel that also broke camel. So now it boot up and, and you can see there's actually already something here on the screen. This is live tweets, so we can go and see them in the web browser as well. Let's see if there's anybody coming. Yeah, there's one there. So. When I created this example, I used to use the keyword Apache Camel or Camel, but you know, there's not so many tweets about that, so I had to wait a long time. So I had to find a more popular tweet, so back then when I actually created it for the first time, I used uh, Lady Gaga. And it was two days before her birthday, so there were a lot of people saying congratulations, blah, 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 so it used to scroll a lot. But here are the live tweets. Okay, so um, one thing I'd also like to just briefly show you is to um, boot up something called Hot.io. So here I start a Hot.io using Java Jar. <coughs> we'll get back to Hot.io a bit later, but just to give a tease for it. So, now we have a different JVM running hard I.O., which is a web, web console. So this is on the screen here. And I'll, what I would like to say is that we can use hard I.O. to connect to other JVMs and see what's going on inside that JVM, whether they are running locally or remote or using some discovery uh, broadcast. So I click here on local, and then it actually discovers what JVMs is running on my laptop right now. And so we have hot IO itself, and then we have the, that Twitter example up here as the first one. Then I can click this button here, which will then inject the Java agent in real time to that JVM I can use to connect to it. So here's a link, I click that one. So it sort of takes me, what well, appears to be the same page, but now pay attention up here, the button bar is a bit different. Now there's a camel button bar. So it'll, it detected that in this JVM, Apache Camel is running, 
So here is a button for that. Click on that, and you can see something. And we can see there's like one camera that has one route. This is the route. And we can see a visual di diagram of that one. So this implementation is, is a trivial example, but it's just from Twitter to a log and then to the WebSocket. And these numbers should go up in real time as they come and go. OK, so this was just a short uh, tease for it. I can also just see a sort of like a source code representation of that round. So this is an XML from Twitter to log to WebSocket. OK, so I just shut down this one. This guy, this guy, and shut down that guy, and this guy. And OK, so what I want to see, this guy. So this example comes out of the box with camel, but it's um, implemented in Java code. So here is the Twitter WebSocket route. Should I make it bigger? So this is the class that implements the route. It extends another class. Because it's Java code, you can have getters and setters. So we have some, a number of getters and setters for some Twitter tokens and keys and whatnot you need to do. But more importantly, down here in the configure method, and we can configure that route. At first, we set up the WebSocket component, and then we set up a Twitter component. But here you can see this is the Java code, these three lines of code from Twitter to a login to WebSocket. Now, then, it, hey, what happened here? So we are running, we develop a Java code route in Camel, run it inside a JVM, use hot IO to connect to that, see that visual representation. But when we click the source code, it was in XML. So why is that? Well, it appeared, well, the reason for that is because Camel is able to take any route built by any kind of DSL, whether it's Java, Groovy, Scala, whatnot, and represent that in XML. So at runtime, any Java route is Camel understands it because it has that logical module of it. And we can use that for tooling to visualize that. So the di diagrams you see is actually reading that XML and passing it to be able to draw that. OK. So let's go back to the slides again so we can continue. Um, there's a lot more examples in Camel. So if you download that distribution, um, you can take a list of that directory. There's a, I think there's a maybe 40 or so. And most of these examples are also documented and further detailed on the website. OK, so how do you create new Camel projects from scratch? Well, Camel is sort of like a Maven like projects. So we use Maven to build Camel itself, or we have Maven tooling. So in Maven, you have something called a Maven archetypes that allows you to generate new products based on a skeleton. So you can use Maven archetypes to create new products with Camel, but has sort of like a ready-made product for you to continue on. And you can do that from the command line. Uh, only you need to remember is Maven archetype colon generate. When you type that in the shell, it runs in an interactive mode, so it asks you, uh, if list all the known archetypes in the entire world, then you can filter that by just typing camel. And then you can choose the archetype you want to know, and then what version you want to use, and so on and so on. You can also do the same using uh, clips tooling, ID, and whatnot. They all have sort of like a Maven archetype wizard as well. Um, yes. When you created that from either the command line or whatnot, you can easily c import that into your tooling. The tooling has uh, uh, import existing Maven product and then just select that directory. Okay. So it's not too hard. So in Camel, we have a number of archetypes out of the box. Or I think this is actually up to date. Um, so there's 10. So we have something for ActiveMQ. So if you need to use uh, the message broker, then there's sort of like a ready-made product for that. Some, there's something called Blueprint. This is for uh, OSGI Blueprint. Um, how many knows about OSGI and Blueprint? Good. There's only three, four. <laughs> OK, that's something. That, that's something by itself. OK, then there's something called Maven Archetype Component. So if you need to create a new Camel component, you can use that one. 
and then you can, while you run that wizard, it, you can type in the component name and so on. And then it has sort of like a, a basic implementation of a component you can continue on. Data format, that's sort of like a, a different kind of for a component in camels, a different flavor, if you will. And then, of course, there's the groovy one, and so on and so on. Um, and a few others that is popular is the spring and the web one. The web one is sort of like for WAR files. You can just deploy them in Tomcat, JD, and whatnot. If you use the Groovy one, uh, it gets you a, a camel route out of the box in Groovy code. Uh, again, it's a trivial one, but apparently you seem to like that Jetty uh, ACP server in Groovy. So we get a little simple one here from Jetty, transform, and then the <coughs> Groovy closure. I guess we got clever this time because we don't have parentheses around trans transform, so this, that's another way of doing it. Uh, the spring one, uh, gives you a sort of like a sample product out of the box as well. One thing I will s emphasize here is that the Spring One, we have a way with Hot IO to boot up your Spring applications and then uh, run Hot IO side by side. So you can run up that camel application and then at the same time you boot up Hot IO and get a web console where you can sort of see what's happening inside your own application if you want to do that. Um, and speaking of hot I.O., so let's try to see what that is. So again, if you go to the hot I.O. website, it says that it's a lightweight and modular HTML5 web console with a lot of plugins. And you use that to manage your Java stuff. So in other words, hot I.O. is one of these um, one-page HTML5 web app. And it has a pluggable architecture, and that's why you saw sort of like Camel, that was just a plugin. And there was this connect one where we can sort of connect to other JVMs, that's also a plugin, and so on and so on. In fact, each of these buttons up in the, in the top is a plugin. So you can also build your custom plugins into a hot IO. Okay, so where did that start from? Well, hot IO was created by this guy, James Strachan. You might remember him from early on. So in uh, November 2012, there is the first commit for Hot.io. So uh, the link for Hot.io is hot.io, and we say it's also you know, tooling. It's a web console with tooling. And I guess we saw that and one of the teasers we do for Hot.io is for camel users, so they can sort of get that camel diagram, and that's why there's a screenshot of that in action. Um, there was a guy on Twitter that posted this photo here with his sort of impression of Hot.io and what it does for his camel application. So he's, he loved that. It sort of enhances his experience with because he can see live metrics, he could do uh, visualization, he could do debugging and tracing and kind of whatnot. So he draw this kind of futuristic flying camel. So you can maybe say that hot you helps you to take camel to the next level. So what are the, some of the technologies that we use in hot IO? Uh, well, as I said, it's sort of like a HTML5 single app, uh, page app application. We are using TypeScript to generate JavaScript, but generally you just use any kind of JavaScript. So you can use, you know, simultaneously as this one, there's a talk about GrooveScript, so that sounds cool. So you can probably use GrooveScript to compile JavaScript or whatever you want to use. Uh, it's, we are using AngularJS for modular and dependencies and whatnot. And, you know, I guess Bootstrap is a very popular uh, styling. And then to communicate with the backend, we use HTTP calls using REST. And then I have to emphasize, uh, we're using a product called Jolokia. Anybody heard about Jolokia? Uh, you should go and, and read about it, jolokia.org. It's an awesome product. You know, I used to hate doing your J uh, JMX management in, in Java. It was a pain just to sort of develop these MBs and being able to call them from different 
JVMs and whatnot, especially in these modern times with uh, web applications and whatnot. So Dialog makes JMX fun again. So the idea is that you just develop your JMX mBeams as mBeams, and then Dialog you install that in the container, or as I did, I actually used the Java agent to install it. And then it sort of bridges REST and JMX. So from clients, it's just a REST call, and then it calls the JMX on your server side. Awesome product. And so the idea is that you develop your plugins, and then you, if your plugins are serviced you need to use from the web client, you can just expose them, uh, develop them as JMX, and then Geolog will take that as a REST. You don't have to use uh, Geolog here on the back end side. You can just still do any kind of REST service you want. And there's a link down here how to solve this, uh, for more information, how this works and these technologies and whatnot. So let's continue to some demo. So we go back to, yes. So what I have here is a standard Apache Tomcat I just downloaded. I booted up using Bean Kalina Run. Inside Tomcat, I installed a bunch, a few WAR files, standard WAR files, hot.io, and a CAM example, and another one we're going to see. So now hot.io is up and running. Uh, Tomcat is up and running. I can go to localhost 8080 slash hot.io. This is the hot.io again. So again, we can see here we got the camel and the connect and whatnot. But I installed a plugin I developed for Groovy Shell. So here I click Groovy Shell, and I have a little input box where I can type some Groovy script. I can say, so you know, we have a calc, oh, that's overflow. Oh, that was too awesome. So yeah, and you know, just to see that I'm not cheating, I think uh, Groovy is the one that can actually do uh, multiply on strings. So if it's Java code, you know, that will take forever to figure out how to do. And if I make a typo, I get a stack trace. And you can probably see down here somewhere there's some groovy, uh, groovy shell, so I'm not cheating. So how did I develop this plugin, and how can you do that? So let's see that I have it actually on, um, yes, on GitHub. So in GitHub, the hot.io is the code, so source code is hosted, of course. And we have a bunch of examples called hot.io plugin examples. And that's a Groovy Shell plugin. So it's just a, well, a maven, it has a maven palm file with the dependencies and then the source code. So source, maybe I use this one to go fast. Main resources. And inside resource, we have a web inf and a web file. Oh, it may be too big. So it's just a standard web XML file with some context parameters and the listener. So we have a context listener to boot up that one. So we install it in Tomcat. This is the guy that sort of kickstarted. So this is a, a class that you implement in Java, of course. So that guy is here. This is the context listener. Standard server contact list. So the, uh, the only thing you need to do is to implement the hot IO plugin and configure it. So you set some options here for your plugin. And then I also create a class called Groovy Shell. This is something I coded, we just see in a bit. And then the destroy stuff here. So clean up resources when the contact is done. So Groovy Shell, what is that? So this is a Groovy Shell is an mbean that, that has this uh, mbean interface. So you can just name the mbean like this, and then the JVM automatically turns that into mbean naming convention. So we have one method called evaluate. So this is what I used before. So you know, Geolocky called this evaluate method for me. And here is the implementation of that one. Um, so here's a shell. This is a groovy lang groovy shell. So it's using groovy shell, right? So. So this is the, then in my init, I register an mbean in the yeah, mbean container, and I take it out in the destroy. And here is the implementation of that evaluate method, where I actually call evaluate on Groovy Shell 
that, return that. So this is the server side implementation. Okay, so standard stuff. So how do you do the JavaScript parts? Uh, where is it? No, it's in web app, plugin. So in here that we have a JS directory and the, it's just the Groovy plugin JavaScript. So and this is uh, what you need to do on this, you can say client side to build plugins for Hot.io. Uh, I'm just gonna show you, you can find more information how to do that on, on the Hot.io website. But here we're using Angular module and we give the module a name and we depend on Hot.io core. We do some configuration. Uh, this is the, you could say the initial page I'm gonna show, shell.html, I can give it any name I want. Uh, then I have uh, some configuration of that shell, uh, my custom CSS file. I tell it to do a full page layout. You can also do sort of like a small and then have a tree. I have uh, some custom help in Hotio allows you to have your own help page. So I've registered that. But what I wanna show is a bit further down. This is the guy that actually adds that Groovy shell button you can click on because you can actually determine if that button should be enabled or not. So you can say, uh, should only be enabled if camera's running, but also only if X, Y, Z. So you can co code that. But here is the Groovy shell Groovy controller, which is what we use from the HTML page. What I wanted to show you finally is that I have a function called evalme. So this is the guy that you know we call when you click that button or press enter on the, on the HTML file. And then if we have some input, if you type something, then this is the guy I wanna show you. So Jalokia also have a JavaScript library that makes it easy to call um, operations and get attributes and whatnot on mBeans. So here I tell Jalokia I do wanna do a request, execute. I call this mBean, this is the me method name, and this is the input parameters, this is what it typed. And if it was a success, then call render. So this is when it's okay. If there was some kind of exception, then render error. And the render method just sets the value to a scope and then the HTML5 page shows that. So this is sort of like a quick and dirty way of how you can actually build your custom plugins for Hot.io and you can do you know, any kind of plugin. So just to go back to, where did it go here, here's the guy. So what you can also do with Hot.io is to uh, brand it. So you can have a, your custom company name or whatnot. And that branding can just be installed as a plugin as well. So you can take the standard distribution of Hot.io, drop it inside your Tomcat or whatnot, and then deploy your own branding plugin and then just change the look and feel and whatnot. You can also do teams and this, we do have some standard teams in Hot.io, so we have a, a good one is the dark theme. So now it gets dark and spooky. And, but there's also this one, this is for guys like me in the old, good old days with the green terminals. Uh, and we can see here the route and this is green and this one is you know, monospaced and everything. Okay, so let's go back to a theme that is more readable. So one thing you, we also have with Hot.io is that it has a log plugin. So you can actually see the server logs and, and see what as they are coming here. Um, and oh, this one is, damn. There's a little bot here. I can see that, you know, they're not supposed to be these scroll bars that is covering those. But the resolution on my screen is small. But what I wanted to show you is that you can actually click on a line that will actually take you to source code that was doing that log. So this is the source code that was, you saw in the log, it was, if you couldn't see those bars, it will say starting order or intended field. This is the text you saw on the server log. But just imagine that if you get a stack trace in your server, then you can use that tool to find that stack trace in the server logs and click on that these different lines in the stack trace and it could show you this, the source code for that. What it does is that it uses Maven coordinates to download the source code so you need to sort of distribute your code as Maven 
or at least generate these slash sources, the R files, so the source code is available for download. Uh, there's also, uh, you can manage your uh, application in here, so just wanted to tell you that this is the Groovy Shell plugin I just deployed as a WAR file. Um, if I stop it, then uh, up here the, the Groovy Shell button is no longer because it's, it's gone. So what I hope reacts dynamically to what's inside the JVM. So if later you install another plugin that has, yeah, let's say there's also a plugin for ActiveMQ, so if you install something that uses ActiveMQ, then that plugin is there as well. Um, the Camel plugin, this is, you know, this is a Camel talk. It also allows you to sort of see these stats update. Let me, there's a debugger, but I don't think we have time to, to try that, but you actually have a debugger, so you can set breakpoints, so you can step through the steps in the route, and you can see the message details during that process, so you can sort of use that to help do the development. But I would like to show you the tracer. So here I'm starting the tracer, and then I'm just gonna find, I have a little script here. So this is a script that calls a HTTP call that is used by a camel application. So one second at a time it calls a camel route and gets a response back. So the idea is that we can actually see these in this update in real time. So 16, 17 and so forth. But down here, you can probably not see it, but all the message IDs is being captured at each step. So the tracer will take a snapshot of the message, each message during the routing. So you can sort of turn it on while it does a lot of stuff and then you can turn it off if you want, and then look at these messages, what happened for each of them. And I can use the cursor down and up, I can go up and down for each message. As you can see, there's highlight where it is in the route. So you can actually see everybody goes down here to the, what is that, the right side. Because, yeah, so I guess you get the idea. Okay, we have almost run out of time, four minutes, so let's get back to the slides. So, almost Q&A. Just before the Q&A, I, I promise about that, ta-da. So these three things have something in common. I guess some people may know it. This guy. All three products was created by James Reagan. And what is the something, what's his next thing? Well, he's, we are, there's a product called Fabricate which is um, also a very cool product. Fabric8.io is the website. Okay, so let's go Q&A. Any questions? What's that? Too little groovy stuff. Uh, Yes, so the question was, um, Camel, uh, you saw there was a, in one of the examples we are using ActiveMQ as the message queue. And the question is, does Camel work with other message brokers? And for example, IBM with VMQ. Yes, uh, we do, Camel has a component for generic DMS. So any message broker that supports DMS, you can just use the DMS component. So for IBM WebSphere, they have a DMS client uh, you need to use on the client side, and then you configure the DMS component. Now, Camel DMS is built on top of Spring DMS, so you know if you're familiar how to use Spring DMS, it's the same way in, in the Camel DMS component. We also do have some other uh, components for um, other protocols like uh, MQTT uh, and AMQP. So. If your message broker is using these kind of protocols, you can also do, use, instead of using DMS, you can use them as well. So if the broker supports these protocols, you can use them as well. Uh, there's actually a flavor of the Camel DMS component we have uh, added in recent time, it's called SDMS, a uh, simple DMS. And the idea is that it's just a pure DMS client uh, API, uh, API, so it has no additional uh, dependencies. Um, because the regular Camel DMS components is built on top of Spring DMS, so it requires the entire Spring framework uh, on the client side, and some people prefer not to use that. So there are different DMS components. Other questions? Yes, sir? Uh, what, what if you have a kind of cluster to cache? Is it possible to have a kind of load balancing between the instances that can be brought into to cache? Uh, 
Okay, so the question is, is there any sort of clustering, load balancing with camel? Sort of, in short, question. So if I go back to this slide, this guy down there is the answer for that. It's one of the answers for that. So in camel, is, well, the, the goal of the camel is that it's just an integration toolbox library. So, and then the idea is that you can run Candyman anywhere. So any kind of clustering and whatnot, you can use some camel components for that if they sort of support that. But the idea was that there are other products in Apache, for example, called Apache Service Mix, which was an ESB that sort of has, was the idea that it has the clustering stuff. But, you know, I'll, if you take a look at Fabric 8, it supports provisioning and managing containers. So you can actually use that to, you know, uh, uh, create new Tomcat containers on the fly and deploy your war files there and be able to load balance them as well. So, but take a look at that. And I'm going to blog about it more, uh, Fabric 8 some more because we have some new videos coming up that show some of that. Yes, uh, it's blinking zero here. I think. One last question, I'm going to stop. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> uh.